All right, we're ready to begin our next panel. Um, we're missing one of our candidates. Um, we will be following the same format that we used in the previous panels. We remind you that a brief description of the responsibilities of the offices that these people are uh, running for is on your agenda. The candidates are Mike Chapman, Jody Wilkie, Steve Derringer, and Jim McIntyre. Um, all four candidates will be given three minutes for their opening remarks. We have asked the candidates to introduce themselves by covering the following information. What are your qualifications? Why are you running for this office? What are your goals for the first year of this term of office? And candidates, please keep your eye on the timers so you can gauge your time. And we'll begin with Mike Chapman. Thanks everyone for being here to thank you for the league for hosting these forums. I always kind of figure these are like a Norman Rockwell moments. Uh, you know, people coming in off the streets and out of their neighborhoods to listen to candidates running for local office. So I'm Mike Chapman, I'm your state current leader state representative and prior to serving as your state representative, I was honored to serve four terms as your Clallam County Commissioner. And before that I had a 10 year law enforcement career. Uh, my wife and I live here in Port Angeles. My wife runs a small business here in Port Angeles. We raised two boys, uh, graduates of Port Angeles High School, and they're both in college, uh, doing really well. And uh, you know, a lot of people don't realize my wife's family dates back to the 1880s on the North Olympic Peninsula, and there's family land that's been owned uh, since that time. And so we're certainly rooted in this community. Uh, we, my wife runs a small business. I've been in public service here in law enforcement and political career, and so we're certainly rooted in the North Olympic Peninsula. We love this area. We think it's a pretty special place, and it's been an honor to serve you as your state representative. A um, Couple of highlights. In my first term, securing $32 million for a brand new Elwha River Bridge. That was not an easy task, and as a member of the Transportation Committee, it took me some work and a lot of support from the community to secure $32 million to have that bridge, and it'll be being replaced about this time next year. Moving forward, one of the priorities for a new term will be lowering the manufacturing B&O rate for rural manufacturers. We know that as our economy has recovered in this state from the recession, that manufacturing jobs still lag where they were pre-recession. The state gave Boeing a very preferential tax rate to stay in this state, but we didn't help rural Washington. And so I put in bipartisan legislation last year in a short session, and I'm working with to reintroduce bipartisan legislation to lower the rural manufacturing B&O tax rate. Manufacturing jobs average between sixty dollars and $80,000 a year with good benefits and, and good, op good opportunities. And so that's a way to really spur our economic growth. One other thing that I'm really proud of is that I prime sponsored 15 pieces of legislation my first two years. Eight became law, but all 15 were bipartisan. And I really believe in working across the aisle to find solutions for our community. And I'll continue to work hard in a bipartisan way to find solutions. Thank you again for being here. Well, hi, everyone. I'm really glad to be here. And welcome to all of you, too. Um, my name is Jody Wilkie, as you know. Um, I'm a single mom. Um, I've worked in the private sector all my life. Currently, I'm a nurse. And I've had a lot of different experiences that have prepared me for this moment in life. I think a lot of us can look back on our lives and wonder how we got here. And I do the same thing. But, you know, I look at the things that I've done, and it seems like it just gives me an advantage that maybe some other people don't have who've been really focused on public service as their um, as their primary uh, goal in life. Um, so as a single mom, I raised my two kids. I've, um, I've worked as a construction worker. I had my own construction company, and um, that was really very interesting. So I got some exposure to that industry. Um, I worked for the laborers union and completed their apprenticeship program, which I was very proud to do. 
Um, I also worked in the yacht manufacturing industry and was elevated from the front desk clerk all the way up to the engineering department where I was given some awards and recognized nationally for my work in the change management program there. Um, that brought me into working with some computer systems and led me from that point to working in the airline industry, um, which unfortunately the company that I worked for was devastated during the 9-11 attacks and I had to take another look at my career and, and decide as a single mom what I'm going to do. So uh, the unfortunate thing with that is it's, it's always hard to pick yourself up and start again, but I've had to do that a few times. And I always seem to come out doing quite well. Um, I ended up in the um, mortgage industry and I worked with investment real estate and that was extremely interesting and that actually is one of my uh, big interests and something that I can hope that I can do for um, our district as I move into this role. Um, unfortunately, we all know what happened with the real estate market <laughs> back in the 2000s and um, I ended up having to send myself back to school at age 50. I went back to college and studied to become a nurse, which is what I am right now. Nursing is one of the most trusted, um, trusted employment jobs in the uh, United States. And also, as you know, I'm not a public speaker. It's, it's a little unnerving, and I don't know that I'll ever get used to it. So if I stutter a little bit, please excuse me. One of my goals for the district is to turn our economy around. You know, um, Mike may have been in, in the legislature for the last two years and accomplished a lot of really good things, I'm sure. But what I ask you is to take a look at the economy in our district and, and how has that helped the little person? How has that helped the average person? Our, um, our people, <laughs> I guess I have to stop. We, we are about 20 to 30% poorer on every income level. Our GDP hasn't increased and our unemployment remains high. And I'd like to fix those things. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Perringer. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm Steve Theringer, your state representative. I've been honored by you to serve in four terms in the legislature, eight years, and I'm asking for your vote for a fifth term. In that time, I've been able to position myself as chair of the capital budget in the House. I sit on the Appropriations Committee, and I also sit on the Health and Wellness Committee. And those three committees, I think, are very helpful for the issues we face here on the peninsula. And I guess the, we're supposed to talk a little bit about what the job is, and I think a lot of you know the separation of government, so we're the legislative branch. We make the laws and we set the budget, the appropriation for the state. So as chair of the capital budget in the House, I have a lot to say of, so there's three fiscal committees. There's the operating budget, there's the transportation budget, and then the capital budget. So I build, the capital budget works to fund four-year colleges, K-12 school construction, clinics, <coughs> mental health hospitals, um, uh, a lot of natural resource issues, uh, culvert replacement, for example, investment in habitat, and that sort of, th that sort of thing. As being on the health care committee and working, uh, also being on the appropriations <coughs> committee, I've worked to be able to strengthen our rural health care system. When I first got in the legislature, I helped designate Olympic Medical Center as a sole community hospital, and that entitled them to a higher reimbursement rate in Medicaid. And then this year, Mike and I were able to re increase that rate by 25%, which meant there was about $1.3 million that came from the state and about $2.7 million that came from the federal government to help us manage our costs, because that's a huge challenge because of our payer mix here in, on the peninsula, but in rural Washington. So being able to develop the policy in the health care committee and then make sure that the budget numbers follow through in the appropriations committee is helpful, I think, for the issues around health care here on the peninsula. Um, as you know, I've been on the peninsula for 40 years, moved out here in 1977, and had a wood manufacturing business for the first 10 years, then got involved in <coughs> county policy, actually, in the Planning Commission. I served on the County Planning Commission for, I think, six, seven years, was chair of that for a couple of years, and then was your county commissioner for three three terms starting in 2000. Mike and I served together, as you know, for 11 years with uh, Commissioner Doherty, um, which I think was a pretty good run here in Clown County. So um, 
honored to be here tonight. It's great to see such a good turnout. Sometimes I think that here on the peninsula, we try to make our own fun. And for some people, this is fun. So, and I'm one of those people, so thanks for coming. <laughs> Good evening. I don't know if this is fun, but it's certainly educational and enjoyable. Uh, Jim McIntyre. I've uh, lived here on the peninsula with my wife Sherry for a, a, a little over the past 12 years. Had the honor of representing the east end of the county on the Port of Port Angeles Commission, and then as a, a commissioner on the Board of Cloudland County Commissioners. Prior to that, um, as many of you might know, I was a Coast Guard officer for a number of years, retired in uh, 2000 as a captain, spent another six years in Washington, D.C. as a senior uh, career civilian official, uh, retired from the senior executive service from the um, Department of Homeland Security, had enough of D.C. and moved out here, and the rest you know. The the plan for the first year in the legislature, number one, there's a learning curve, as with everything. Number two is to find a seat on the committees that are of most relevance to the 24th district. Those would be committees involved in natural resources and agriculture, uh, business regulation, taxation, environmental regulation, and the like. Um, there is um, a lot to learn about the state budget. I was the Coast Guard's budget officer. It was one of my last duties when I was on active duty in the Coast Guard. And let me tell you, the federal budget, which I have some knowledge of, is a model of clarity and transparency in comparison to the state budget. So it takes an, an awful lot of study and um, digging through the, the various pots of money to find out exactly what is, is supposed to happen and then look and see what actually has happened to find out if what we're doing at the state level is actually working. Um, and so I, I don't know if I need to take up all of the, the three minutes. I really do want to get to your questions because I think as, uh, as was said previously, I learn a lot by just listening to your questions and trying to think up an answer that makes sense to them. So thank you for being here. Thank you to the League for sponsoring this forum, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, candidates. Now we will take as many questions as possible from you, the audience. We'll follow the same procedures as with our previous panel. Please come to the microphone and state your name. We were a little sloppy about that with the last panel. Not everyone gave their name, so please do so this one. Um, you will have up to 30 seconds to ask your question. The candidates will be given up to one minute to answer each question. And um, tell us which of the sets of two and two your question is directed to. And each of the two will have a chance to answer and rebut each question. Over here. And if you have questions, you should line up over there. And if you uh, refer not to line up, but just have your questions submitted, uh, we have someone here who will, you can write your questions out. Just make sure you put your name on it, and we'll be happy to read it. If you don't wish to come up to the mic, we will read your question for you. All right, first question. Marilee Smith, and this is actually for everyone. Um, I, um, I keep hearing a lot about you know, manufacturing. We're far off the beaten path. What I would like to know is what we can do, what you would do to, to um, fix our fiber optic problem. We had fiber optic laid. The city of Port Angeles basically has blocked it, so nothing west can get it. Um, we really need to have fiber optic for um, enterprise uh, business in this area. It's a perfect area for for programmers. So, what would you do? All right. Thanks for coming. Start. 
Um, I totally agree. I mean, broadband fiber optics is really a utility. Um, if we look at education, if we look at healthcare, telemedicine, if we look at, uh, as the questioner mentioned, you know, a, a programmer's ability or a designer's ability to move files in and out, I mean, broadband is fundamental. So. Uh, as capital budget chair, we funded some, uh, we put about $18 million into the Community Economic Revitalization Board to start looking at rural communities and the need for broadband. And in the world of broadband, that's not a lot of dollars, quite frankly. And, but what we, what, what we, why we did that is we wanted to get a sense of where the need is. I mean, what's, I mean, I get the weeds about broadband pretty quickly, but there's a lot of dark spots but what's interesting about the dark spots is one of the commercial cable companies or a or Verizon will run a cable to say a hospital and then they'll say there's coverage in a 60 70 mile radius when it's not true so one is you got to define the problem and then secondly um, you know stop <laughs> Boy, that's a short time. I'm just getting going. <laughs> All right, Mr. McIntyre, would you like to? Yeah. One minute goes by pretty quick for a southerner. <laughs> a different cadence of speech. I look at rural broadband in the same fashion that uh, the federal government looked at rural electrification back in the 20s and 30s. It's um, it's almost a necessity, and I agree with my opponent that it's, uh, it is a priority. I understand there was a bill that had strong bipartisan support in the legislature last year that just didn't get addressed for whatever reason. So I would expect that would be revived in this upcoming session. And uh, should I have the honor to represent you, I would, uh, I would be a strong supporter of that. There are existing legal authorities right now for PUDs and ports um, to do, uh, to install um, fiber optic or communications uh, infrastructure of various, various kinds uh, on a wholesale basis. They can't sell at the last mile retail, as it were. But I would surely be interested to see how that might be, might be accomplished in a, in a joint fashion. Thank you. Karen, would you like to rebut? Uh, I, don't, I don't know if there's anything to rebut there, but I, I will just say two weeks ago I spent three days in Denver on a, as a representing the state in the National Conference of State Legislators on broadband. And one of the things I learned there is there, there's literally hundreds of millions of dollars available out there through the federal government, through the cable companies themselves. So what we need to do is, and I think the governor is working on this, have a coordinator in his office so that we coordinate those different funding sources and then use, I think, the state dollars to sort of match that to fill in those gaps. But I think you'll see a pretty robust effort to get broadband out into the areas that aren't served at this point. Thank you. Mr. McIntyre, would you like to No. All right. Now, Mr. Chapman, would you like to answer? Here's your microphone, moderator. Mr. Chapman, would you? <laughs> Uh, first of all, I serve on the Community Economic and Revitalization Board, so I'm actually one of the deciders who moves that $18 million, and we've been moving it out this, this summer. Also supported legislation to bring broadband to the Macaw Tribe and to the Quinault Tribe, and working with uh, uh, the private sector, and those projects are moving forward. But one of the other things about broadband, and we saw earlier this year, the federal government want to put a break on our internet speeds and our access to the internet and so washington state i'm proud to say on a large bipartisan vote of 93 to 5 off the house floor 35 to 14 off the senate passed house bill 2282 becoming the first state in the nation to protect your internet speeds so we could have put all this backbone out there and still left it up to the private sector they could have controlled our internet speeds and so we are the first state in the nation to have true net neutrality I've been to a lot of these forums, and as Jim has said, it's always a learning experience. Um, I have learned that the PUD departments are very interested in trying to help get broadband through to the remote areas, and that's a big thing that, that they consider as a part of their budget and 
trying to maintain um, liquidity on into the future. So uh, from the state level, I was informed early on in the campaign that there had been a proposal to put about $100 million into rural broadband by Representative DeBolt, that that didn't make it through the committee process. And when I take a look at decisions that are made like that, we have to decide if that didn't make it through the committee process, it was because something else held a higher priority for the funding. And so this then becomes an issue of deciding what our priorities really are and where we want to spend that money. Thank you. Would you like to, would you like to do any rebuttal? All right. Our next question. Uh, I'm Denise Mackenstad. I live in SWIM. Uh, as many of you know, the SWIM North Peninsula area has a large population of seniors. And what I'd like to know from you all is what are you, what do you see the legislature doing and what can be done to help provide a good continuum service and lifestyle for our seniors in this area? All right, let's start with Mr. Chapman on this one. Well, like Steve mentioned, uh, we've got to make sure we have health care, the health care workers, the trained workforce for the next generation. So. We knew there's a nursing shortage on the North Olympic Peninsula, and so we worked with the community college, and we were able to get a budget proviso to start the second nursing program at Peninsula College to make sure that the need for nursing, there's also a tremendous need for medical assistance, surgical technicians, and so we're working hard to make sure that those um, college programs are fully funded. Also, our local hospitals, we, put a, we have Medicaid reimbursement rates for low-income seniors and for other low-income folks. And we're making sure that we're putting the money in. We put a significant amount of money into the Grace Harbor Community Hospital to keep that hospital solvent. We're working with Olympic Medical Center. We also funded, and I'm probably stealing a little bit of Steve's thunder because he did all this through the capital budget. And these were some priorities. There are tough choices that you have to make, but we also supported the Demo Clinic for low-income uh, medical and dental and brand new dental clinic over in Jefferson County. We also, earlier this year, <laughs> enacted a 30 cent per thousand property tax decrease cut that will help the seniors too. That stop comes off awfully quick, doesn't it? <laughs> As a nurse, I will say I'm glad for the robust support for the medical community and I know how that affects seniors because that's the um, industry that I actually work in and I love working uh, as a nurse. So, um, and I also appreciate the fact that they've looked at education for nurses, but one thing that that program overlooked was an LPN to RN bridge. And that's something that I would like to bring to the table uh, as, as I go into the job. Um, I am very much into um, keeping taxes low because I know how much that affects people on a fixed income. In fact, that's what actually brought me into politics in the first place was sticking up for the senior citizens over in Jefferson County when they wanted to impose a, a property tax increase. So um, I applaud the 30 cent decrease that Mike has managed to put into place. Unfortunately, it cost us a buck to get that 30 cents back when they raided the rainy day fund. Um, so it's, it's kind of a, I don't know, time to stop. <coughs> Oh! <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, yeah. Strange credulity to say that cutting your taxes for next year costs you a dollar. It's saving you 30 cents per thousand, and the state has put a billion dollars of new money into the rainy day fund this year, fully complying with the Constitution, and the state has more money in the rainy day fund than ever before. And in another bill that I worked on was House Bill 2747, which would give seniors the ability to write off their property tax, their medical expenses. It's a bill I'm going to bring back next year because I think that's one way that seniors can also have property tax relief. Does Josie get a rebuttal? Oh, sure. Why not? In the spirit of fun. Um, I think the, the deal with the rainy day, rainy day fund is, is a little unclear. Um, 
they took $100 billion, or shall I say, diverted it. And it was scheduled to go into the rainy day fund, but was managed to be diverted out of it. Now, if we're going to have an increase in social services and things like that, we are going to need to be prepared for times when our revenue is low. We may have the most amount of money in our rainy day fund than ever before, but I'm telling you, at this rate, we're going to need it. All right. Mr. McIntyre, would you like to answer? <laughs> Either way, it doesn't matter. Well, oddly enough, the one thing that I think is job number one for seniors is to increase permanently the Medicaid, Medicaid reimbursement rate. Um, such low uh, reimbursement rates really make it difficult for medical care uh, practitioners and providers to make a living out here. If they can't make a profit, they won't be here. And that's really a, a shift in cost to private pay um, patients of whatever medical care providers there are <coughs> out here. And ultimately it could mean an increase in property taxes because of the, the necessity for uh, hospitals like OMC to uh, come to us, the taxpayers, to make up the difference for their uncompensated care, which they have done in the past. So that's number one. Number two is to do any and all things that either remove impediments from economic growth or add things that encourage economic growth so that the people that, that change our bedpans in the hospitals and, and the like can make a living here. And I'm getting a stop signal. Uh, as folks know, we live in the oldest district in the state. Our median <coughs> age is about 65, and the 24th legislative district is how the rest of the state is going to look by the end of the decade, or certainly in the next 15 years. And so I co-chair the Joint Executive Legislative Committee on Aging, which is House and Senate members and Executive Branch members. And we actually just had a meeting on Tuesday looking at a number of issues, but the best strategy is to allow people to age in place and provide a continuum of care from it staying in your home, then, and almost 80% of the in-home care is provided by family members. So looking at that, looking how do we provide training for them, how do we provide respite for them, and then as you move around the, along the continuum, at some point you have maybe someone come into your house, an individual provider. Then maybe it's an adult family home. Then maybe it's assisted living, then it's a nursing home, as you move through that continuum. But we're gonna to need to support all of that. The state spends about four, two and a half billion dollars on long-term support services. And then pensions and COLAs for folks that are retiring to make sure that they aren't having to make the choice between their drugs, their food, and their rent. Thank you. Mr. McIntyre, would you like to rebut? Not, not to rebut, but just to supplement my answer. Um, here's an economic statistic for you, for Clallam County. 46% of our school children come from families that are poor enough to qualify for free and reduced meals in school. That tells me that somewhere around half, maybe a little bit less, of our uh, young families with school-aged kids are really in desperate economic straits. How can we as seniors live in a place without workers? Um, and so the economy underpins everything. Uh, Mr. Ferenger, you have 30 seconds if you want to use it. No, I think we're good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question. Hi, I'm Deborah Pitts, and I'm from Swim. And I'd like to ask this question about four of them. If there was a bill to make Washington State a sanctuary state, how would you vote? All right, um, Mr. Ferenger, would you like to start? I've never heard of any such legislation, but I think... Uh, um, California is a sanctuary state. Yeah, so um, I think overall, in a, as being a public servant, looking at what government provides, humanity is probably, in human to human relations is probably number one. So I'd support it. 
Well, immigration, of course, is in the province of the national government. I'm going to try to look over here so I don't run over my time. Um, and I, I wouldn't support such legislation because anything that inhibits communication and cooperation between law enforcement agencies, both at the local, state, and national level, I think, uh, tends to uh, hurt public safety. And so I, I would not be inclined to support such a, such a bill if it were to come up. Should such a bill come up, I would vote against it. Um, I really believe in the sovereignty of the United States. I also notice that we spend a lot of money supporting um, people who are not resident um, citizens here. And this takes away from things. We're asking questions about rural broadband um, and how to help the people that are already living here to uh, make a living. And these are kinds of things that draw on uh, the generosity of the American people. So I would have to vote against something like that. These are those, uh, these are those moments in these forums where this isn't a serious question because this piece of legislation has not been drafted. There's nothing to look at. You don't know it's whether it would be a one paragraph bill or 50 pages. Lots of our legislation is one page. Lots is 50 pages and more. And it's not a serious question because I don't have a bill number to say I sponsored it or I didn't co-sponsor it. So one paragraph, just a, just a statement that says Washington is a sanctuary state, nobody would draft such a bill, nobody would drop such a bill, and nobody would support such a bill. But a comprehensive immigration reform bill where the state took the lead because the federal government's not acting on, I might look at it if it's comprehensive, if it makes sense for our community. So. Again, hypothetical bills could be from a paragraph to dozens and dozens of pages, and I don't know, I can't answer that question. No such statement bill has been drafted, nor would I support just a statement bill like that. But comprehensive immigration reform from a state perspective might make some sense, since the federal government really is inactive on that issue right now. Mike, how can you say that that's not a uh, We won't have follow-up questions follow -up. yet, I'm sorry. Um, you said it wasn't a serious like question. It was serious. Sure. It's a concept question. I appreciate the seriousness and the serious nature of that question because I come from Port Townsend, which has declared itself a sanctuary city. So I understand that, and I understand the problems that the police officers have in dealing with these issues. <clears throat> um, I would also point out, however, difficult it might be, that this non-answer is, um, I guess, classic. Uh, we had direct questions asked on several different occasions and find it difficult sometimes to get a straight answer from my opponent, which is unfortunate. Um, I think I would like a straight answer on the sanctuary concept. And um, I would also like a straight answer on other things like the, the carbon bill. Um, and I would also sorry, like to your time has expired. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Mr. So Chapman, let's hope like we can get some straight answers. All right. All right. Then we're ready for our next question. This question uh, is from uh, Mel Clausen and it's addressed to Mike and Joe. Uh, what are your top two goals once elected or re-elected and be specific on how you will achieve these? All right, Mr. Chapman, you start. Like I said, I drafted legislation last year to lower our B&O manufacturing tax rate. I built a large bipartisan coalition, business groups, labor groups, folks across the political spectrum, politicians across the political spectrum. So that's going to be a bill with probably a couple of dozen, if not over 30 co-sponsors. And it's my number one priority moving forward to help move our rural economy Forward. A second bill that's really important to me is a, a bill that I worked with Commissioner uh, Johnson last year. It's the Veterans Levy Bill. So currently when counties levy the Veterans Levy for veteran services, low-income veteran services, it actually is 
debited against the county general fund. And I drafted a bill, and we're going to build some bipartisan coalition to allow that levy to move out of the general fund so that counties can continue to increase the veterans levy without impacting their general fund. So those are two of my high priorities to help veterans, to help our economy move forward. No rebuttal on that. No. Hope this isn't counting part of the No. Okay, well, um, one of my top priorities is to try to help deal with the housing crisis. That intersects closely with the problems that businesses are having in this area, and of course the b &O tax would also help to, to improve that situation. But um, I would like to take a look at the Growth Management Act and how that's affecting the ability of our communities to build housing where we need it, when we need it, and also how that affects the ability for businesses to grow their business because they're prevented from building the types of facilities that they need in order to um, continue to grow and prosper. So this is a big interest of mine, having been previously in the um, mortgage industry and investment real estate. And I know that there's a lot of ways that we can come together and do that and, that, and provide low-cost family homes for people that are not necessarily supported by government programs. I would like to see us at least have some sort of a balance in the housing industry where we are always looking to the government to provide what they call affordable housing. Thank you, Mr. Chapman. Would you like to? <coughs> would you like to? All right, Ms. Wilkie, would you like another 30 seconds? Um, I'm good. All right. Lovely. Next question. Thank you. I learned an interesting new term. Oh, I'm sorry. Ron Richards. An interesting new term. I guess I've been aging in place waiting to ask this question. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, a specific bill like uh, House Bill 2341, uh, which you and, and Steve and, and Kevin uh, helped defeat last year, would have given uh, military uh, control of land use planning in the state of Washington. Would you oppose that bill if it comes up again? I, I, the question is to all four of you. Okay. Let's start with McIntyre. <coughs> to make sure I'm clear on the question, Ron, this was a bill that would have given the military control over land use planning? Any commander of any military base, no matter how small within the state of Washington, would have had veto power over any local regulation. If it affected the military base in any way. Well, that, that seems rather strange of a bill to come up in the legislature because it seems to run a foul of the, at least the Tenth Amendment to the national to the federal constitution because I don't think land use planning is reserved to the to the national government. Um, so I, I'm just curious about how that bill is characterized. Certainly, on the on the peninsula, we've had a presence of the military, the Navy in particular, but uh, Air Force and Army for quite some number of decades. So. Um, you know, the military has generally been a good neighbor. We have the Coast Guard installation right here in our, in our Port Angeles Harbor. And so I, I would look to see how we can improve on that relationship between local governments, the state government, and the military, not, not, um, not anything even remotely like what you just described. I don't know if that bill is, uh, Representative Rees is still working on that bill. Um, part of the idea is if you imagine uh, trying to base Lewis McCord and their landing and takeoff areas, and we can sort of relate to that because of what's happening with our airport here. So the idea was to have the military's input on land use around their bases. I think it went too far, obviously we didn't support it, but I think the, the idea is to have better 
dialogue with the Department of Defense on what with the community on what they're doing and what the community is planning on doing. And I, I think those are the refinements that might be coming with the with the you know during the interim and working on the legislation. So that dialogue I think is always helpful. Obviously giving up local control around land use to Washington DC, which is ultimately what you'd be doing, doesn't seem to make good sense. Mr. McIntyre, would you like 30 more? Mr. Sterringer? All right. Um, Ms. Wilkie, would you like to answer this same question? I, I'm going to take a stab at this. Um, not being involved in um, this sort of question before, I did anticipate that it had something to do with the effect of the bases uh, and the land around it, the people that live there. Like we have the problem over on Whidbey Island with the Growler Base offending a lot of the people who moved in there. Um, and that is, a, it is an issue. Our, our military needs to be supported with their activities and not wind up in a bunch of lawsuits after the fact because people don't like the loud planes. So um, I think that I would try to uh, involve more communication, like a group of experts to advise on this issue, um, because I can certainly see both sides. One of the big concerns that I would have would be if they're going to take land out of useful service or off the tax rolls because of its proximity to a base, how will that affect the, the tax uh, generating ability of that land for the county and, and for the state? So that would be something to consider among probably many other issues. Sorry, I've got to stop. Mr. Chapman? So this was a bill, uh, this is awkward. This was a prime sponsored by a, by a member of our Democratic caucus, uh, Representative Reeves, and it would have allowed the, the basically, as written initially, would have allowed the military to come in and kind of override local zoning, local planning, and I, I, I personally led the charge against that because I didn't want to give up our sovereignty as a community. And all the, obviously, 16 years experience as a county commissioner, I understand that you go through a lot of public meetings, and this would have bypassed all the public meetings and just let a military commander come in and take, basically tell the local government what they were gonna do for the military. So, a little awkward to argue and, and, and build a coalition against a, a Democratic bill, but it was the right thing to do. Plus, a lot of public input from this district came in. And uh, the military is kind of looking at some public meetings. So there'll be a public meeting coming up uh, real soon in Jefferson County. So they're kind of rolling back out to get some of their thoughts and ideas. We'll have to watch this, because again, we don't want to give up our local control, our local planning decisions. Thank you. Ms. Wilkie, would you like 30 more seconds? I agree in terms of not wanting to take control of this local communities as far as land use is concerned. Um, that is a is an issue. So, um, but I think that it's um, extremely harmful to our military and even to the communities that surround these bases to have an expectation that they can come in after the fact and try to modify the type of activities that our military needs in order to practice their um, maneuvers and to keep us safe. Uh, we need to have our military supported and we need to have their ability to perform their um, whatever you call them, practice sessions without hindrance. Mr. Chapman, would you like? Again, the, the way the bill was originally drafted, it became large bipartisan opposition. Communities from all around the state were weighing in, so Republicans, Democrats, and that's why that bill died. We'll see how it comes forward next year, but we'll need to watch this. Ron, I know you were a watchdog. Many people from Jefferson County will watch this carefully, and we'll see how it comes back. It'll have to build, uh, but it was bipartisan opposition. So. All right, next question. Hi, I'm Marsha Lamose from SQUIM. I have a question somewhat related to land use. We live, obviously, in a very beautiful and peaceful place, as we're very fortunate to do. Historically, this community has been uh, somewhat dependent on resource extraction, if you will, economically. I've uh, spoken with people who lived here in the 70s who said PA used to be booming. Um, how do you value the environment today? 
All right, we will begin with Mr. Chapman. So if you're concerned, if you believe that climate change is real like I do, and if you're concerned about the impacts of climate change, you can be very proud that you live on the North Olympic Peninsula. You can be very proud that you live in a community that sequesters much more carbon than we ever generate. And as we move forward, it's, it's really clear that about 25% of the carbon the United States generates is sequestered in the coastal forests of Washington, Northern California, and Oregon. So we're doing a, we have a great environment to sequester carbon to combat climate change. We also have an economy and a natural resource-based economy. And so what I believe is that Rep Representative Kilmer, through his Forest Service Collaborative, which I was able to secure funding to staff that collaborative, is going into the Forest Service with, so with very intensive and selective thinnings to thin the forest, take that wood to product. Once it's made into a wood product, that carbon is sequestered forever, leaving healthier trees with more space to grow bigger, st stronger, taller, and sequester more carbon. And the number two, generally the number two carbon emitter in our state is wildfires. And so by working our natural, by working our forest, we can combat wildfire uh, loss as well. All right, thank you. This is really annoying. Um, how do I value the environment? That's kind of an, um, going off on a little bit of a different tangent. Um, well, so there is a um, tension between human habitation and the environment that's sort of just naturally inherent. And I, I really think that we need to be careful as citizens in this area that we respect the environment, that we, we need to have some growth, but we need to have it in a healthy way. So um, I, would, I would look for ways to promote that type of healthy growth. Um, I agree with this carbon sequester concept, although the, the small trees, not the big trees, that sequester carbon faster. Um, the young trees that are growing, just the same as our young teenagers, eat everything in sight. So the similar thing with the trees. So, so the small trees, as they're growing, um, sequester carbon much better than the old growth big trees. Um, that, that kept in mind, um, I think that we need to do what we can to promote our industries that will utilize that resource in a healthy way. It's a very scientific resource. Mr. Chapman, would you like to rebut? So everybody will say that uh, we're for the environment, we're for the economy, and I'm really, I'm honored. I'm the vice chair of the Ag and Natural Resources Committee, and after two years in the legislature, I was voted as an environmental champion, and I also won a national award as the Washington State Legislator of the Year by the World Jobs Coalition. So I actually believe and have walked that you can do both. You can be an environmental champion and receive a national award by the World Jobs Coalition. And that's a fundamental value, I believe, as a county commissioner, and I take to the state legislator, obviously incredibly humbled to receive those awards. I don't know if he can do it, why can't I? <laughs> yes, that's all I have to say about that. I think that when I'm in place, I'm going to do just everything that I can to do a great job looking out for our environment and looking out for the economy and our people in this area. And I think that every opportunity should be pursued to do both. Um, I agree with my seatmate, uh, my chapman. It's a false choice that you have to choose between economic development and, and environmental health. And when we look back at the 70s and the harvests that were happening in the 70s, those were not sustainable. I mean, there's no way that the forest would have produced that. We were cutting trees that have been growing for centuries. And now the discussion is back again because it's, you know, it's about a 40, 50 year cycle and now the forests are coming back. But we can find that balance. This is a great place, one of the best places on the planet to grow trees. And as Mike mentioned, there's some huge advantages around carbon sequestration. And if we develop the sort of ecosystem values around that, I think uh, we can even get some not just environmental climate benefit, but some economic benefit. As some folks know, I piloted a project uh, to build 24 classrooms around the, the state with mass timber 
from my position on the capital budget. We built four of those in Carlsberg at the Gray Wolf School. And that's an example of where we get value added out of small thinnings out of the forest. But um, the only other comment I would make is, as far as the environment, is the issue around climate change. It's very real. It needs to be addressed. And if we don't deal with it now, and there's going to be costs, there will be greater cost, costs in the future. All right, Mr. McIntyre. Well, I, I do think we have in this state a, a custom and a, and a culture of valuing the environment. Uh, so I would, I would certainly look to continue that. Where we have soiled our nest, so to say, in the past, I think we can continue to do things to clean up those, those problems that we've created in a way that really doesn't stress the economy for, for local citizens. But the other thing is to put equal value and equal emphasis on economic growth. For instance, the Department of Natural Resources right now is considering a sustainable harvest plan that will sequester more timber, state-owned timber, that provides funds for my opponent's budget for school construction and money to local taxing districts, districts, counties, fire districts, and so on. Uh, in favor of a, a seabird called the Marble Murrelet. We've seen this movie, new movie before with the Northwest Forest Plan, and that, that is likely to really damage this county's in particular economy. All right, Mr. Farringer, again. Uh, just a little bit of clarification on the Murrelet. Actually, the plan will release more more uh, timber right now there's a there's a large set aside and there has not been a forest uh, a lands commissioner that's been willing to move this this decision forward uh, the current lands commissioner hillary font is doing that and there's uh, a lot of political risk and a lot of challenge around that but once the plan is is decided and agreed to by u.s fish and wildlife the set aside will become smaller there will be impacts there's no question because that will be a permanent set aside, but in the end, there'll be less acreage that's set aside than right now. I respectfully disagree with that. The, um, the set of options that were originally created by department staff, Department of Natural Resources staff, in conjunction with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, would have one option would have released more acres for harvest. The rest of the options would have sequestered more uh, from harvest, kept more timber from harvest. So all of those options satisfy the, the requirements of the Endangered Species Act. The legislature is the trustee. The legislature can, can do the right thing for the environment and the economy. All right, next question. Um, before, oh, 